So for Remembrance Day weekend, I went on a World War I movie marathon. So why not share the movies I've watched and rank these World War I movies based on historical accuracy and realism. That way you don't have to waste your time watching crappy depictions of the Great War. So the ranking, how it works, S is the best, then you have A, B, C, and D. D, let's put it simple, all the movies I'll put in D will have to be collected by the trash truck. Because I truly believe movies can actually combine realism and entertainment. Mostly because some movies actually manage to do this. The other reason I'm doing this video is because after my reaction to Netflix's movie All Quiet on the Western Front, some people say that I don't like any movie, I'm too critical. But after talking to these people, a lot of them have never seen other World War I movies apart from All Quiet on the Western Front and 1917. And they admitted that they haven't read any World War I memoirs from actual veterans. To me, it's like if somebody tries their first burger at McDonald's. And then they say, oh my god, it's so amazing. McDonald's has the best burger. Alright guys, guys, let me walk you through the best burgers in town. The Wagyu. The Kobe beef of war movies. All the movies I'll talk about will be in the description below. And disclaimer, there might be spoilers. In the next video, I'll make a ranking with only World War I aviation movies with the help of Aviation Dad. This video might be a bit long, 30 movies long, but I hope that at least some of them will hit all the right spots. Are you ready? Let's go. All right, number one, Wooden Crosses Les Croix de Bois from 1932. This one, I'll put it in the S category right away. No questions asked. This movie is a gem and there will be no other World War I movies like this one ever. As a rule of thumb, the best World War I movies though have been made right after the war between 1919 and the early 1930s because this is when most veterans were still alive. Wooden Crosses is as close as you can get to realism and entertainment. Considering the movie is almost a hundred years old, Wooden Crosses is one of the first talkies compared to silent movies of the 1920s, which are also excellent, I'll have some in the ranking, but they're unwatchable by modern standards. Now you might ask, what makes this movie so great that it belongs in the S tier category? The reason is simple, most of the leading actors all fought during World War I. Some even fought from the very beginning, 1914, up to the very end, 1918. One of them, Charles Vanel, even noted, we didn't have to act, we simply had to remember. But what's truly unique is that the movie director also fought during the war. And to make his movie as realistic as possible, he actually picked an actual battlefield in Champagne. The trenches were still there, they simply had to revamp them. But while filming on this actual battlefield, they actually uncovered dead bodies and unexploded artillery shells. For any great war movie, you need a lot of extras. So here the movie director talked with the French military and they sent him a couple battalions of recruits that were doing their military service. But the movie director was so unhappy with these recruits. He said the way they behaved was not realistic. He was unhappy with the way they stood in the trenches, unhappy with the way they ran across the no man's land, unhappy with the way they fought. So movie director Raymond Bernard actually called up some actual veterans as extras for a more realistic feeling and it shows in every scene. Number two, All Quiet on the Western Front, the Netflix version. Let's say this movie was not remarkable. If you're interested in my entire analysis, I'll link it in the description below. Overall, the equipment they used is on point, but can we actually say that the movie properly depicts the experience of a German soldier in 1917 and 1918? To me, it's a no. That's why I'm gonna put it in the C category. It doesn't belong to the trash, but... Also, let me know in the comment section if you agree with this ranking or not. All right, now we move on to Blizzards of Soul, a Latvian movie from 2019. I also made a reaction to it. I'll be in the description below. Usually Baltic countries, Scandinavian countries, they make very realistic war movies. Sadly, Blizzards of Soul is the exception. You know me, I'm a bit harsh. I like the idea of the movie. It's a rare depiction of World War I on the Eastern Front. But the people that wrote the script were so lazy. I read some actual Latvian reports about the story of these Latvian riflemen, what they went through. 
but the movie decided to make a new story it doesn't respect the actual place they fought how they fought and and so on the movie also rushes from one time period to another we start in world war one then we go towards the russian revolution and then the latvian war of independence and it goes faster and faster i feel the story should have been a bit more fleshed out maybe a couple episodes would have been excellent and fun fact all quiet on the western front actually copied a couple scenes from blizzards of soul especially the enlistment scene when you see the boys in the shorts at the beginning it's the same scene very similar and that's why i'll put it in the c category movie number four is <laughs> it's called sayan singh rangroot an indian movie from 2018 honestly it's one of the funniest war movies i've ever watched just honestly watch it just for the the laws. It's so anachronistic. The only thing that's accurate is that Indians participated during World War I. That's about as historical as it gets. <laughs> For example, the Germans are using World War II uniforms and weapons. And not any uniform, they're using World War II German Fallschirmjäger, the paratroopers, their uniforms and even their helmets. They're firing 82 millimeter mortars and I think I even saw an MG42. And the movie... <laughs> shows the British as so evil that they're insanely racist towards the Indians. These Englishmen have never seen Indians in their life before. It's the first time they see them. No, they hate them right off the bat. <laughs> and at one point in the movie, in the middle of the battle, <laughs> the Germans want the Indians to surrender. And <laughs> if they do so, the Germans will give them German citizenship <laughs> and free education. <laughs> These are the terms and conditions. Then the Indians refuse and the character goes on a Bollywood music video in the trenches. Where should we put it? All right, this movie belongs in the trash. I'm sorry. <laughs> in terms of historical realism, yeah. <laughs> How about we go back to reality? West Front 1918, a German movie from 1930. Fun fact, it was released seven months before the American made All Quiet on the Western Front. And it was inspired by a German novel called Fia von der Infanterie. It's an even more tragic depiction as All Quiet on the Western Front. At one point you have one of the soldiers that, that is allowed to go back home and he simply cannot relate to his family anymore. His mom won't even leave the food stamp queue to greet him. And when he goes home, he finds his wife in bed with another man. And if we talk about combat realism, this movie is a very good depiction of the late war 1918 combat compared to Les Croix de Bois, which is set in 1915. For example, one scene is very tragic. The German artillery mistakenly fires on its own trenches and you have a bunch of German soldiers dying from friendly fire. And they only stop by the time that a messenger goes back to the rear to tell them to cancel the, the, the artillery fire. And like I mentioned in my All Quiet on the Western Front reaction, the movie shows exactly how the French infantry would attack, how they would storm German trenches, especially with the use of their new tanks. There is no hand-to-hand -hand fighting, fighting with shovels and all this. The soldiers get to the trenches and simply flood it with grenades. Fun fact, a lot of World War I soldiers have never fired the rifle. So, where do we rank West Front 1918? Honestly, it belongs to the S tier. Yeah. La première question que je voudrais poser, si vous le permettez, c'est à nos invités ici, les anciens combattants de 14-18, qu'ils soient allemands ou français. Après les images que nous venons de voir, je voudrais savoir quel est leur sentiment 50 ans après, lorsqu'ils ont vu ces images sur le front sur le front sur lequel ils ont combattu pendant quatre ans. Et je voudrais demander d'abord à M. Kronfeld, qui fut un lieutenant, lieutenant de la garde prussienne, de nous dire ce qu'il a ressenti et ce que vous ressentez maintenant, puisque j'ai vu tout à l'heure, vous étiez euh, très, émo très émotionné. J'étais en effet très émotionné parce que le film est vrai. Il est même trop vrai et pourtant, il ne donne pas encore un centième de ce qui était. Since we're talking about a movie inspired by a book, I highly recommend you my book, The Great Veterans Project. It has hundreds of war stories, among them 50 forgotten World War I first-hand accounts from dozens of countries. And I'm telling you, they're some of the craziest stories I've ever read. 
And because of these untold stories, I'm also very critical to war movies that always redo the same thing over and over. Stocks are almost empty. So if you want it by Christmas, order now. Link in the description below. Next up, 1917. I know a lot of you love this movie. I also made a reaction to 1917. It's actually one of the first videos on History Legends ever. I went to the movie theaters with my friends to watch the movie and it was amazing. The visuals, the soundtrack, the costume department did a great job. It's just that I think it's more of a thriller set during World War I than a World War I movie. In my opinion, 1917 is just very far away from what British soldiers would have actually experienced. My first video ever on History Legends was about the Canadian attack on Vimy Ridge. I read through so much material, so many reports about the Canadian attack, very detailed reports, that it completely changed my mind about how World War I was fought. What's ridiculous in the movie is how come in 1917, a British battalion just attacks the Germans on his own, without artillery, without support, without logistics, just like that. It's so unrealistic. And the cherry on top is how they show modern UK demographics in a World War I movie. You have black soldiers, Indian soldiers, and they're all mixed up together. All the Indians speak perfect English. You know, I'm laughing at the Indian movie we just reviewed, but at least in the movie, only the commanders speak English. The Indian soldiers didn't speak English for the most part. You have to remember that the British did not even mix Irish, Scottish, Welsh or English troops together. They all fought in their own units. Now, is it an accurate portrayal of World War I? Honestly, no. I, it's with the Indian movie. It's not as bad. So I'll put it in front of the Indian movie. Can I do it? Yeah. In my opinion, the story of 1917 could have been much better. Had it been inspired by a British movie called Journey's End, all they had to do was to take inspiration from good movies of the past and just make it better with modern technology. But that's too much to ask for. Talking about that movie, Journey's End, 1930. It takes place in 1918, right before the German Spring Offensive. They know that something is up, that the Germans are about to do something, but they're not sure what. So they send patrols, they send raids to capture prisoners to see what they have to say. It's a great movie because you have the British humor. For example, you have two guys looking over the trenches and they're smiling, they're joking around. They say, oh, what a beautiful sight. Oh yeah, it's very lovely. Modern movies are also grim and dark and gore, but they forget the friendship and the joking around that took place. But I also like the realism of the few combat scenes, how they go on a patrol and how all the soldiers, you see the fear, they're all clumped up together, they try to take cover. And unlike what most modern movies show of frontal attacks where everybody dies, patrols and raids were also very bloody. And interestingly enough, in the movie, they never talk about the mud or stuff like that. Okay, so where is it? Okay, it's here. I'm gonna put it in the S tier as well. And this is another criticism I have for modern World War I movies. They're always set in the mud. No, no. A lot of times, most offensives during World War I were done in the summer exactly for that reason. No mud. It's the same thing in Ukraine today. All right, next movie, Path of Glory, 1957. In this movie, Path of Glory, it's a fictional depiction of the French mutinies of 1917. For example, one of the scenes that is very famous, you have Kirk Douglas, the regiment commander, whistle in hand, he leads his men into battle. Now, let's be honest, a regiment commander would probably not have been in the first line like that. It would have probably been a captain or something in reality. But let's say it facilitates the storyline. And this is exactly what I like in this movie. It takes into account the hierarchy. For example, in the middle of the attack, Kirk Douglas asked about the situation of neighboring companies. We see the entire chain of command, how headquarters calls the artillery to set up an artillery barrage. And we depict something we rarely see in World War I movies. All the wounded soldiers making their way to the rear. And then they're just waiting there to be picked up by medics. Another criticism for modern movies. During an attack, they all die. No, a lot of them got wounded and they were crawling their way back or somehow they got to safety. And as you can imagine, a lot of opportunist soldiers would wait for one of their friends to get wounded to help him get to the rear, just as an excuse for themselves to get out of the battlefield. Now, the only thing is that the way the movie depicts the mutinies is exaggerated. 
And during the mutinies of 1917, it was more like one or two per division that were that faced the firing squad. So it's a good portrayal, but it's a bit exaggerated. I'll put in the A category. Overall, it's good. Although I really like Path of Glory, this movie is also the one that started the trend of putting a bunch of obstacles, a bunch of barbed wire, X-shaped barbed wire, and all sorts of stuff in the no man's land. It looks cool, but it's not historically accurate. Every movie director after that just took it for granted and copied his style of filming. Now, since we're talking about execution, Le Pantalon, 1997, The Pants. It's a true story. The movie is so realistic. At one point, I forgot it was a movie really shows the life of the soldiers in 1914 with their infamous red and blue uniforms. You see how most of them actually were peasants. So they didn't mind the hardships of World War I. They were used to a much tougher lifestyle. All they asked for was for dry hay. We also see the very beginnings of trench warfare and how messy it was because there was no tactics. It was a new type of warfare. Fun fact, you also see priests in the trenches, which you never see in movies but which is historically accurate so i'm gonna put it in the s tier let's jump to an american movie called the great war from 2019 okay you know what I i'll tell you right away it belongs to the trash oh my god honestly it's one of the worst movies i've ever watched and not just from a historical perspective but but just from a movie perspective it's so bad the movie's cringe horrible script horrible actors it completely skips the fact that the buffalo soldiers fought with the french in french equipment now in this version is some silly racism but they still fight side by side with white americans and of course there's this blm racism theme that keeps coming back and the battle scenes are so bad like there's not even trenches you just see two lines of soldiers firing at each other standing five meters from each other yeah a very long engagement 2004. This movie is very famous for its cinematography, for the aesthetics of the movie. So much that almost every World War I movie after this one copied a very long engagement. What I like in this movie is that it properly shows you the daily life of French soldiers in 1917. You see every aspect of the life in the trenches. Now the main thing that is inaccurate, as always, is the combat scenes. It starts with your typical evil captain the french troops in the trenches are getting pummeled by german artillery it's always in the mud the captain comes out and says yeah the germans are bleeding us to death we have to attack now it doesn't even make sense the trench is the safest place where you can put your men by going outside they're all gonna die <laughs> i don't understand it's like if you have one of your friends that says oh i want to save money that's why i'm gonna buy a new car <laughs> those are two opposite statements <laughs> and then it's your typical frontal assault against german machine guns of course the attack without prior artillery barrage yeah yeah i mean i i give it honestly it's not terrible not great not terrible i'll give it a b plus the netflix version all quiet on the western front copied a lot from this movie too okay talking about all quiet on the western front the 1930 version and the 1979 version. I'll put them together. They deserve the grade A. These two movies really depict what was World War I like as a German soldier. You really get the feeling that being at the front was only part of your life as a soldier. As a matter of fact, most soldiers during World War I would only spend one week a month in the front facing the enemy. In Wooden Crosses, there's this scene where they actually do this rotation and in both these movies, you actually get the sense of brotherhood that these soldiers could have experienced. All right, up next, Capitaine Conan, 1996. Another French movie. As you can imagine, World War I for the French is their great patriotic war. The French prefer to make World War I movies compared to World War II movies. And you probably know why. Captain Conan is a great movie because it talks about a forgotten front of World War I. It takes place in 1918 in the Balkans. And you see the last French offensive of the war there, which made Turkey collapse, Bulgaria collapse, liberated Serbia, and then made Austria-Hungary collapse. 
and these French soldiers, after winning the battle in the Balkans, they end up in Romania, and then they want to go back home, but the French command is like, no, nah, you have to fight the Bolsheviks now. But yeah, the movie is really great because it focuses on trench clearers, how a couple thousands of men did the dirty work. It's like the equivalent of German Stoßtruppen, but the French version. They use any tool available to them. Honestly, I think this movie is great if you want to learn about a new part of World War One, a new front. I'll put it in the S tier. I'll put it at the end of the S tier. Passchendaele, 2008. It's the best Canadian war movie ever made. But that's not a hard title to get because Canadian war movies suck. It, they're so bad. I'm ashamed. Compared to that, the Australians, to my Aussie friends, you guys are one step ahead of Canada. The only problem is that half the movie is set on the home front in Alberta with some cheesy Canadian love story. Now when we go back to France, in the front, I like how we talk about the organization of a battalion. It clearly talks about what objectives they were meant to capture. And overall it shows this operational side of World War I that is often missing. Also the landscape in the movie is identical to what the Canadians would have faced at Passchendaele. However, you know the drill, the combat scenes, disappointing. Let's say that the great battle of Passchendaele is depicted as a tug of war in the mud, where the Canadians are actually defending against some fat German NPCs. Zero tactical skills. The people are strangling each other, they're taking knives, machete, I don't know, shovels. I told you, you can read the reports of these men on the ground. You can read this book. Hand-to-hand -hand fighting was extremely rare. All right, you know, it's not bad, it's not terrible. I'll put it in B. Movie number 15, Ceux de 14, Those of 1914. This miniseries is inspired by the memoirs of a French soldier, a lieutenant called Maurice Genevois. Fun fact, Maurice Genevois and Ernst Junger from Storm of Steel actually faced each other in 1915. Despite the restricted budget, I think the miniseries did a great job. They're very accurate in their portrayal of combat in 1915, the way Maurice Genevois experienced it, with small company assaults, bad coordination with artillery, and rudimentary trenches. Here, let's put it as an A+, like high-end A. Next in line, War Horse. I also made an entire reaction about it in the comment section below. Aviation Dad looks like Benedict Cumberbatch, like they have the same face. But what was disappointing in War Horse is that with everything we know about the true story behind it, they decided to make shit up. That cavalry charge against the German camp does not make any sense, historically speaking. Now the attack at the end is okay and I'll take it. It's not too bad, although it could be in the category with C because of the cavalry charge. Okay, now a movie that you probably never heard about. Mons, a silent movie from 1926. It depicts the great 1914 Battle of Mons. And to give the sense of scale for the battle, the movie director recruited extras from the 1st Wiltshire Regiment. But let's say that their acting skills are comparable to your average infantryman's acting skills. <laughs> the reason I put it right after War Horse is that in Mons, it actually depicts the actual scene of the cavalry charge. That should have been in War Horse. And we clearly see that cavalry was more like mounted infantry. You see the British infantry in a huge field firing from a prone position. Or if they can, they would use the cover of terrain or buildings. And what's interesting is that the newspapers reviewing the movie at the time said the movie portrays the battle as accurately as could be reproduced. And they all said that most was the finest motion picture of World War I. I would say it's a low end S, like S minus. Okay, let's talk about the TV series Anzacs from 1985. And it shows the experience and the daily life of Australian soldiers from Gallipoli up to the Western Front. This is one of the most accurate portrayals of the daily life of soldiers during World War I. However, there's a lack of budget regarding battle scenes. They're always downgraded, they look kind of silly. C category because of the combat scenes. Like it's a C plus, honestly. It's a C plus. Okay, is it worse than War Horse? That's the question. Hold on. The ranking is interesting because once you position them, you can compare. 
it's hard to say, but it, War Horse is still better, <laughs> despite my criticism. Now let's talk about Gallipoli, a 2015 Australian TV series. They also face some budget limitations, but it's excellent. You see how the Enzac Corps disembarks in the early days of Gallipoli and how the units are lost in the mountains. They have no way to contact headquarters down below, so they have to send runners back and forth. And by the time the runner comes, the situation has changed. They have to send another runner. The runners get shot at. Anyway, it was a mess. I even think that in one of the scenes, the Australians were taught to fire only at the order of their CO. So it was really like a century before where they're like, okay, fire one round, fire two rounds. They quickly abandoned this. <laughs> but my favorite part of the entire series is how they portray the battle of the neck. It's exactly how it happened. They, I think they portrayed the battle at the same time scale, the same minutes that it took for the battle to, to be, this is how long it is in the episode. And it's so tragic. You see the first line being called up. They go up and after a couple of seconds, you have less and less yells and it suddenly ends. And then you have the second wave going up, knowing what is going to happen to them. And then you have the commander that basically loses his entire battalion. I think it's very similar to the French show Ceux de Quatorze. There's the same vibe. We see that they don't have massive budget, but they successfully scale down the battles according to their budget. Like it doesn't look lame. Talking about lame battles, my boy Jack. This movie basically is famous because it has the actor of Harry Potter playing John Kipling. But the depiction of the 1915 battle of Luce is very loosely inspired. As always, movie directors, script writers, instead of reading about John Kipling, and the actual battle that the Irish guards fought in. Nah, screw this. The movie depicts all stereotypes. You have a trench, you have mud, you have rain, and then you have a frontal assault, whistles through barbed wire, and then they're getting mowed down by German machine guns. And this is every single World War I movie ever. So in reality, what happened to John Kipling is that the second battalion of the Irish guards actually crossed one kilometer of open terrain before they reached some sort of wood. Until then, the attack was fine. They suffered barely any casualties and they dug in into the woods. This is where a brigade of Scots guards arrived at the woods and basically all together, they attacked a new German position in some sort of redoubt. And this is when John Kipling was K. Okay. So my boy Jack, honestly, I belongs to the trash. Yeah, the trash. Like it's not a good portrayal of what actually happened in front of 1917. It's not that bad, but we clearly see that the people that made the movie had no intention to make it historically accurate. And in that case, why make a World War One movie? Chanakale. The movie is interesting because it's the Turkish perspective of the Battle of Gallipoli. Problem, it's like a Turkish war soap opera. <laughs> I can see the effort, I just can't get into the story. The movie just retells some heroic moments of the battle with bad CGI. The only fortifications they have is some sandbags piled together. And then the British all get wrecked by elite Turkish fire. And then the Turkish fixed bayonets charge down and just destroy the British. <laughs> If you want to know how the early landings at Gallipoli actually happened, check out my video about Battlefield 1, the, the run of mission. It gives you a perspective of what it was like. I'll put it a C minus. Here's a movie called Hero at the Front from 2019, the Forgotten Portuguese Expeditionary Corps. The main problem for me is that the movie is clearly filmed in Portugal. The movie is supposed to take place in northern France. And because of that, it's impossible to really get into the movie. World War I is fought in some desertic landscape. And the combat scenes are full of CGI. The, the guns have no recoil whatsoever. There's no tactics. We don't even know how the Portuguese soldiers train for World War I. The Portuguese are just expert fighters. They're better than the Germans that fought since 1914. So this movie is like the equivalent of Chana Kale. It's only interesting because... The topic it covers is rare. Up next, The Lost Battalion, 2001. The movie is interesting because it shows the true diversity of the United States during World War I. They're supposed to be replacements for some sort of platoon. I like how in the movie they show the green recruits that arrive at the front and how they're being introduced to differentiating different weapons, the sound of artillery shells and stuff like that. The biggest problem is that the location they chose as if they decided to film this in some Tennessee city park on a sunny Sunday afternoon. 
The movie is supposed to take place in early October 1918. It was full of mud and it looked like hell. But in the movie, it's all green leaves. All the trees are intact. No sign of continuous artillery barrage for years. Not a single tree destroyed, no craters. Apart from craters in the no man's land, this is the only part where there's war. You also have lousy trenches. So the American ones are well done, but they probably didn't have time for the German ones. Again, the Germans have no tactical skills. All the fighting takes place within five meters of a gun. So the lost battalion, let's put it in the C range. Like not that bad, but the march on the Drina. 1964. It's a brilliant Yugoslav movie. It's a true immersion of World War I as seen by Serbia. More specifically about the Battle of Mount Ser in 1914. They didn't have CGI at the time. And the Yugoslavs were known to have thousands of extras available. They actually fired with their artillery. The real explosives is exceptional because they filmed it at the actual location of the battle. Which is more realistic considering the range of their rifles you can see the horses carrying the artillery the mood is joyful they're happy all of a sudden it rains and all the cans are stuck on the muddy roads and then you have the artillery and they have to push to the mud and it's much less fun all of a sudden not like your typical world war one movie where it's always rain and mud and you don't compare it with times where it's not mud overall i think it's a very good portrayal at least for that period of the war for Serbia, I'll put it as an A. Next up, Lawrence of Arabia 1962. This movie is a masterpiece, not only from a historical perspective, but also from a simple movie, cinematography. Now, once again, there are some inconsistencies with reality. The movie was inspired by the book of T. Lawrence, and T. Lawrence was known to make things up or embellish things by putting himself as the hero of every journey. But there's stuff, for example, that are inaccurate. For example, the Arab soldiers are depicted as undisciplined tribesmen when in reality they had uniforms and they were trained by the British. Or how there was a French mission side by side with T. Lawrence. I think the movie deserves a A-. minus. Merry Christmas from 2005. What I like about the movie is that it's explicitly said that it's a work of fiction and basically they said that they took actual events and they just put them together. Information was actually taken from real stories. It's just not one true story. But I like the effort. I like the effort and with the little budget they have, they did a good job. Fun fact, there's Daniel Boyle in this movie and he's also in All Quiet on the Western Front, the Netflix version. He carries every movie, honestly. Great actor. All right, I'll put it an A. Then we have an Italian movie, Uomini Contro from 1970. This movie was criticized at the time for being very leftist and anti-war. And it's a bit cartoonish in the way that you have evil officers that don't care about their men's life and the body of proletariat going to die. Now it's not known to many, but Italy, despite starting the war one year after everybody else, have executed more of their own men than all the other countries. Over 1,000 were officially executed. And the movie clearly shows that the commanders were maybe patriotic, but had zero tactical strategic skills. And they just launched one attack after the other. And if it failed, it was because of the soldiers and their lack of spirit in battle. There's some parts where I'm like, okay, it might not have happened like that. And once again, we talk about a front that is rarely talked about in the mainstream media, the Alpine Front during World War I against Austria-Hungary. All right, so where do I place it? You know what? I'll put it as B+. I say B+, but as you know, B+, A-, minus, they're very close to each other. So it could... It's very similar to the other movies from the 1960s. Then we have another French movie called See You Up There from 2017. In my opinion, this movie also inspired Netflix's All Quiet on the Western Front. You have this cartoonish captain that is purely evil. He hates the men he commands. And on the last day of the war, he sends them on one last assault for his own personal enjoyment and glory. And when you see the special effects, it's very similar to All Quiet on the Western Front. And the special effects are well done, but the French did not attack like that at all at the end of the war. The reason is simple. They barely had any infantrymen anymore. They had suffered so many losses in 1914, 1915, 
that they were like, okay, we have to think of something else. This is why the French invested so much in motorized artillery, tanks, and aviation. So see you up there. I'll put it with his brother and sister right here. Last one, Sergeant York, 1941. So the story is about Alvin York, one of the most decorated American soldiers of World War I. It's a very American movie because it uh, talks about a tough southerner, tough American guy, but that's also religious and who's a very good sharpshooter. And the big story is how York single-handedly captured a huge mass of German soldiers. The movie we clearly see it's filmed somewhere in California and the Germans are very silly in the movie. I rarely say this, but this movie deserves a remake. Is it a proper portrayal of what Alvin York experienced? Is it a proper portrayal of Americans during World War I? But at the same time, they do show that the Americans attacked with several waves. There was a first wave, they get scattered, then you send a second wave. Uh, you know what? Is it? Uh, you know what? It's hard at this point. Is it better or worse than War Horse? I'll put it in B. It's not bad, not terrible. For 1941, it's very good, let's say. And if you stayed until the end, there's a bonus for you right now. I have to present you another World War I gem. The movie is simply called Verdun, Visions of History from 1928. It's a silent movie. This movie is so realistic that a lot of snapshots, a lot of parts of it are used in documentaries. For example, this picture here of a French soldier getting shot is often shown in documentaries, book covers. It's actually part of the movie. The movie is exceptional. If we take into account that it's from 1928, it talks a lot about the first day at the Battle of Verdun. At one point, you have two French battalions under command of Colonel Drian, and they're holding some woods. The Germans hammered them. 80,000 shells on their positions alone. We're talking about 13 shells per square meter out of the 1,200 light infantry he had in the morning. After the bombardment, only 300 were alive. And these 300, after hours of bombardment, had to face 13,000 Bavarians. After 48 hours, only 120 were alive. A lot of the extras in the movie are French and German veterans. You even have French General Pétain playing his own role in the movie. And the main character of the story was also a veteran of World War I, but he was a pilot. Honestly, if you can watch this movie, just to learn how it was, how World War I was like for the people at the time. It's very accurate in this portrayal. It's right there in the S tier. So we are finally done. So here's the final ranking, the S tier, Les Croix de Bois, West Front, 1918, Journey's End, Redan, Visions of History, Le Pantalon, Captain Conan, and Mons. And once you have watched these movies, compare them to the modern depictions of World War I. This is why I did this ranking, this is why it's taking so long. I wanted to do it once and for all, for you to understand where I come from when I review war movies. Do you agree with this ranking? If not, let me know in the comment section. Also, let me know if I've missed any movie in this ranking. If you wanna support the channel and my efforts, make sure to support me on Patreon and PayPal.